Welcome everyone to today's webinar brought to you by No Diabetes by Heart, a joint initiative between the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. I'm Sarah Bradley, Senior Managing Director for Professional Education and Engagement. I'm thrilled to be with you all today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to recognize the supporters of No Diabetes by Heart. We have our founding sponsors, Boeinger Ingelheim Lilly and Novo Nordisk. We also have our national sponsors, Bayer, Sanofi, and AstraZeneca. Thanks so much for your support. Uh, today, we want to draw your attention to the closed captioning feature. Uh, there is a little box on your, the bottom of your screen that says live transcript. If you're interested in that option, just click that, and that should start the live closed captioning for the webinar. Uh, as we wait for everybody to get on, want to invite you to visit our newly redesigned website, nodiabetesbyheart.org. There you can find some of our patient downloadable resources. Uh, you can also find some interactive clinical tools and also a complete library of our podcasts and our webinars. Uh, speaking of webinars, we have two upcoming webinars we'd love for you to register for. One is on the 100 years of diabetes advancements. Um, another one is on the great research that will be coming out of the American Heart Association scientific sessions. So check it out at nodiabetesbyheart.org and register for both of those. Uh, I would love to introduce our esteemed panel today um, and also do uh, just a quick sound check, make sure we can hear you both. So uh, why don't we start with you, Dr. Sean Oser. Hi, I'm Sean Oser from the University of Colorado where I am an Associate Professor of Family Medicine and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Great, thanks for being with us. And Dr. Ann Peters. Hi, I'm Dr. Ann Peters from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where I'm an endocrinologist, but almost entirely a diabetologist, and it's great to be here. Well, thanks to you both for participating in our webinar. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, Dr. Diana Isaacs uh, with the Cleveland Clinic was also going to be a part of our panel, but due to some last minute circumstances, she's unable to attend, but we will be sharing some of her slides throughout this presentation. So I also wanna thank her for her participation uh, in this webinar. We will be doing a question and answer. So if you have any questions during this presentation, just pop them into the Q&A box. We'll try to get through as many as possible possible by the end of the presentation. And I think that is it for our housekeeping. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Sean Oser. Thanks, Sarah, very much. And thanks again for having me join you today. Um, we already talked about who I am, and these are my disclosures. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit about diabetes technology, and especially as it relates to cardiovascular health. So we're going to start talking about connected insulin pens, then we're gonna look briefly at insulin pumps before we spend a lot of time talking about continuous glucose monitors. So connected insulin pens are a reusable insulin pen. They accept short acting insulin cartridges. They have built in temperature monitoring. So this helps ensure the integrity of the medication that we're going to the effort to inject. Um, it, this can be nice if someone leaves their, uh, their insulin, for example, in the pen in, in a car in a glove box, which of course is not advised to do, but happens sometimes. And um, this can alert us that the, the insulin has been out of uh, reasonable temperature range. They can synchronize with um, and integrate with continuous glucose monitors, with blood glucose monitors, which can be helpful too. And they can track insulin dosing and data, and they can connect wirelessly to a smartphone app, which really has some interesting um, uh, benefits. So they can include a dosing calculator to recommend what dose should be given. So the math that's involved in converting the number of grams of carbohydrates, for example, into a number of units of insulin. And this can uh, be more precise using this kind of technology and take some of the decision-making and calculation off of the patient's shoulders. They can calculate and display how much insulin is on board so they can compensate for how much of the last injection or injections is still reasonable to expect is still acting. So this can allow more rapid dosing, for example, if someone needs an additional dose of insulin because they're going to eat some more um, rather than waiting a few hours until that dose is completely out of their system so they can more rapidly correct and not wait in hyperglycemia longer than necessary. And on the other side of the coin, this automatic calculation can deduct from a recommended dose so that the risk of hypoglycemia is reduced and they don't give too much insulin. And clearly reducing both hyperglycemia and reducing hypoglycemia can have significant cardiovascular benefits. 
And finally, the smart pen can log the doses given, which can be really useful since taking an insulin injection multiple times a day can make any one injection look and feel a lot like others they've given. And patients not, may not remember if they actually took their last dose like they intended to, or like they think they remember having done. So with injectable medication like insulin, it's not like you can look in your pill organizer to see if you took your Tuesday evening pills. And obviously we wanna make sure for general health, for diabetes treatment, for cardiovascular benefits of treatment as well, we want to make sure that people are actually taking their medication when it's supposed to be taken and not skipped and not given twice, which can also, of course, have detrimental effects. So these are some important ways that smart pens can be helpful. And if we then um, move on to insulin pumps, insulin pumps can do a lot of the things that the smart pens can do and actually have been doing it for longer before smart pen technology um, was developed. And a traditional open loop pump, which is uh, an insulin infusion uh, device, uh, allows more flexible insulin dosing. So multiple basal rates can be programmed for different times of the day and for different circumstances, which can have advantages over someone taking, for example, a once a day injected long acting basal insulin because you might need different basal insulin um, uh, dosing at one time of the day versus another or uh, with activity versus um, uh, being more sedentary. Um, they include dosing calculators, much like the, the smart pens do, uh, which allows for more flexible dosing and correction dosing. And this also reduces um, the patient's uh, insulin uh, prescriptions down to probably just one type of insulin because they're just gonna have one type of insulin in the, in the pump uh, rather than having to deal with two different prescriptions, one for short acting, one for long acting. And um, uh, patients actually like having this benefit of not having the extra copay, for example, and not having to juggle their insulins. And then still within insulin pumps, that was open loop where all, the, all we were talking about is the infusion of insulin and having nothing to do with, um, with, with glucose integration. But hybrid closed, loops, closed loop pumps, they feature the same, uh, the same capabilities as traditional open loop pumps, but there's some key additions. So they are integrated with continuous glucose monitoring, which we're gonna talk about a good bit in just a, a few minutes. And they have variable degrees of automation of the insulin dosing based on pre-programmed algorithms that are meant to interact with the, the, the glucose information and to adjust the insulin. So for example, if hypoglycemia is present or if it's predicted to occur based on the continuous glucose monitoring data, then it can automatically suspend insulin delivery or reduce insulin delivery and try to avoid the hypo, hypoglycemia or at least limit its severity, limit its severity or limit its uh, duration. And if hyperglycemia is present, then um, they can administer additional insulin to try to correct this rather than waiting until the patient notices and uh, attempts to correct it themselves. And then next is the idea of a fully closed loop pump, which is not quite here yet, but it's on the way. And this allows more automation than what uh, the hybrid closed loop systems feature, allowing complete or nearly complete automation of the insulin delivery. So again, it's integrated with the CGM and using controller algorithms. And again, it can adjust for hypoglycemia or try to prevent uh, or limit hypoglycemia. It can try to adjust for hyperglycemia and correct that faster. And there's uh, at least one system in development uh, currently that's nearing um, uh, the end of its study and uh, uh, for release um, or for submission to the FDA. And it continuously adjusts basal rates, the correction factors, the mealtime insulin settings, which is a tremendous amount of work typically to figure those out in practice. Um, and, uh, and this system, this hopefully future system can figure all of that much, uh, much more quickly and much more accurately and continuously adjust and continuously learn. So there's a, a great future for technology in these areas. There's a great present state already and it continues to advance actually rather quickly. And that brings us to continuous glucose monitoring, which has really enjoyed a tremendous um, uh, explosion of, of evidence and progress uh, lately. And it's the backbone of these hybrid and fully closed loop systems, as I was discussing, and the connected pens, but they're also extremely useful all by themselves. So they hold great promise for diabetes management with great um, in, and increasing evidence, as I mentioned. There's great satisfaction by patients who especially appreciate not having to do finger sticks anymore. Um, and they uh, can tell us especially much more about glycemia in several key ways beyond what we're used to uh, dealing with, uh, for example, just with a hemoglobin A1C. So how do they work? Um, there is a, a, an interstitial, a subcutaneous interstitial sensor, uh, which is uh, under the skin, it's introduced by a needle, which is immediately withdrawn generally with the click of a button. And uh, it measures the interstitial fluid glucose concentration, which is uh, very closely reflected within just a few minutes of the blood glucose concentration. So as the 
um, as glucose uh, enters the interstitial fluid from capillary circulation, um, this is what that's measuring. And there is typically a transmitter attached to the skin uh, with adhesive that um, holds the, that filament under the skin and transmits that data to, um, to a reader device, either a standalone reader device or a smartphone, um, or in, uh, in the case of a different type of technology, it holds that device until, uh, until that um, information is scanned from it. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of CGM devices, and these can really be split on two two different uh, axes, really, two different uh, uh, modes of categorization. There's real-time CGM, which are systems that measure and display glucose levels continuously. They actively push that data to the reader device, whether it's a, uh, a standalone device or a smartphone. It doesn't wait for the patient to do anything about it. And then there's intermittently scanned uh, CGM, which measures glucose levels continuously, but they only display the values when you swipe the reader or smartphone over the, over the sensor. Um, a newer version does have some, uh, some data that's pushed um, in a continuous way that allows some alarm capability, which the real-time systems all have. But, um, uh, but in general, the, the intermittently scanned systems hold eight, uh, up to eight hours worth of data. And as long as you're scanning as frequently as that, then you'll, you'll miss no data. But uh, the patient has to initiate that, um, that activity by swiping the, the reader over the, over the device. So that's real-time versus intermittently scanned, but there's also professional versus personal. So there are personal systems of both real-time and intermittently scanned where the patient owns the, the system because you write a prescription, you write an order, they get it either from the pharmacy or from um, a supplier through durable medical equipment. Um, and they, they have access to the data, but professional systems are owned by the practice um, and they are meant to be placed typically on the patient uh, in the practice, in the, in the office. And then they go off and they live their lives and it accumulates data. And then when they come back or return the, um, the device, you download all the data all at once and you can look at it then retrospectively and review it with them. There are billing differences um, and uh, we'll, we won't go into those today, but there's, there's good reimbursement for each of these services. And these are what some of these systems look like. So um, the, the Freestyle Libre Abbott is a real-time um, a real-time system, or by Abbott, it's a real-time system. I'm sorry, it's an intermittently scanned system, rather. They're updated. The Freestyle Libre 2 does have some real-time features. The Guardian Connect Medtronic system is shown in the upper right. The Dexcom G6 system, you can see. And then the Eversense system by Essentia is different in that it's not a subcutaneous uh, interstitial uh, filament, but it is an actual implant that involves a, a minor office procedure to, to uh, introduce that, get that up and running. But the main differences are that the um, you can have as little equipment as is shown in the top two, which is where you have the reader device. You can also use a smartphone in that case. Um, and there's the sensor is the small round white disc below it, uh, very much like the Guardian Medtronic system. Um, and the Dexcom system shows a lot of stuff, but you don't need all of it. You need the, the, the transmitter, which is uh, uh, in, uh, inserted into the sensor, which is the small gray piece at the bottom. And the, um, the, the thing with the orange button is the inserter device, which is just shown to, uh, included here to show um, that there's, there is an inserter device, which is uh, common with um, uh, these systems. And it basically involves the press of a button after some skin prep. Um, and then you could use either a smartphone or that um, uh, dedicated reader device. Uh, if you're using a smartphone, it can push to a smartwatch also, but a lot of, a lot of flexibility. Those are the personal systems. And there are professional systems from both Dexcom and um, Abbott. So here's a, a, a peek at those. And again, very similar looking equipment, uh, the difference being whether it's practice owned or, or not. And then, so why, why use CGM? Um, and I, I like to look at this in comparison to finger sticks. And you know, there are, uh, it's still commonly um, recommended often that patients check a finger stick blood glucose once a day. Um, and that seems traditionally often to be done in the morning, which I think there's some value in that, but um, I don't find necessarily tremendous value in it. If you're, if you're doing once every morning finger sticks, I kind of uh, liken that to looking at your speedometer on your way out of your neighborhood uh, on the way to work, which again, it's good to know if you're in a good place, um, uh, obeying the speed limit as it were on your way to work, but it doesn't really tell you much about what happens the rest of the day. And if you add in multiple daily finger sticks, in this, in this case, all four of these data points for this patient during the day are in a, a desirable target range, the green shaded area here, but we still don't know what's happening in between. So this is like, you know, looking at your speedometer several times throughout the day. But with CGM, we can really see a whole lot more. We see what happens in between each of these data points. And in this case, it reveals 
some unrecognized highs in the morning and in the afternoon between those um, those data points that we otherwise thought were all uh, where we would really like them to be. And then it also shows some unrecognized lows. And this isn't atypical. There's a, there is a lot of unrecognized hypoglycemia, especially overnight. Um, but with finger sticks alone, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't know how to do this, um, especially since so much of that hypoglycemia can be asymptomatic. Now, why else should we use CGM? Instead of those, those pictures, um, there's evidence that CGM can lower or maintain A1C, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes, patients with type 2 diabetes on insulin, and evidence continues to emerge from more and more use cases and more and more patient um, scenarios where, where it can be useful, different treatment regimens. We know that CGM can reduce hypoglycemia, which clearly has uh, an association with cardiovascular outcomes, especially um, arrhythmias and, and in some cases, cardio, cardiac death. Um, so reducing hypoglycemia obviously can be beneficial. CGM has been shown to be able to identify incorrect patterns of hyperglycemia and patterns of hypoglycemia. It allows more rapid feedback on lifestyle modification efforts. So if a patient is advised to increase exercise or to change their diet, it, it's, uh, it can be a little bit more difficult for them to understand what changes were made or to sustain those changes if they have to wait until their next A1C three or four months later or so. Uh, but if they can use a CGM and get some feedback over just the ensuing week or 10 days or two weeks, then it can give them much better feedback on, on having made those changes and sustaining those changes. And there's good evidence that, um, that CGM use can be associated with improvements in quality of life. So uh, again, um, uh, the, reduce, the reducing the finger sticks, reducing hypoglycemia, um, being able to follow remotely. So this, is, uh, this picture actually is of myself uh, and my daughter at a moment when we both happened to have the same glucose uh, by our sensors at the same rate of change, which was that it was steady. Um, but uh, for, for children who are going to school, generally they're not the population we're talking about with type 2 diabetes and, and cardiovascular health, but that's nice. But um, for type 2 diabetes patients, especially older patients, for example, who, um, who may have an adult child who is uh, looking in on them or wants to wants to uh, be apprised of what their situation is, being able to follow glucose remotely is an option that that uh, is available with CGM. But mostly it comes back to patients really loving not doing finger sticks anymore. So um, uh, this other picture of my daughter is because she uh, she didn't want us to check her glucose even in the middle of the night. So she hid her fingers from us. But um, there are certainly the clinical benefits I mentioned and then uh, from from the healthcare perspective side of things. And then patients just really love not checking their, their finger sticks, not poking their fingers. So CGM brings with it a whole host of new metrics um, that I'm just going to touch on briefly. And we're going to see more of in a bit um, uh, from me and then from Dr. Peters. Um, and there's measures on the left, there's targets on the right. The targets have been uh, agreed upon by international consensus of multiple groups, which is terrific. Uh, but starting with the GMI or the glucose management indicator, this is Easiest to think of as an estimated hemoglobin A1C, although officially we're not supposed to call it that, um, but it's really, uh, it's calculated from the average of the glucose readings from the sensor and it's converted into A1C um, units of percent. So if the, if the target A1C for most patients with diabetes is less than 7%, then the target GMI for those same patients would be less than 7%. Time and range or TIR is um, uh, looking at the standardized and again, agreed upon by consensus uh, target range of 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. So this is the percent of all the glucose sensor readings that fall in that range of 70 to 180. Uh, time and range is roughly um, uh, associated with A1C. Uh, it's not an exact correlation because they're not measuring the exact same thing, but, um, but there's good correlation between uh, time and range of 70% being roughly equivalent to an A1C of 7.0%. So again, if the target for most people with diabetes is to have an A1C less than 7.0, the target for time and range is greater than 70%. Then we can look um, at time below range, and this gives us some insight into hypoglycemia, which we certainly don't get from A1C. A1C is really a measure of uh, hyperglycemia, since most people don't attain um, the, the recommended target and they're above that target, or euglycemia at best. It certainly doesn't really give us much insight into hypoglycemia, and CGM can really do that. So it looks at time below range, time less than 70, all of, all of the readings below 70, and the, the recommended target range for that is to spend less than 4% of the total time uh, below 70. And then a subset of that in the very little range or less than 54 milligrams per deciliter should be less than 1%. You can see 
targets for time above range, total time above 180, and then a subset of that being above 250, being uh, the targets being less than 25 and 5% respectively. And then another, another feature where we, uh, we really don't get any information from the A1C is about the variability of glucose. And as we're going to see, again, from Dr. Peters on the bit, there is some, some correlation of how much variability in the glucose there is with cardiovascular health and outcomes. So in general, less variability uh, is associated with better outcomes, higher variability is associated with worse outcomes. And because we're measuring all of those, um, all of those ranges of uh, the glucose uh, values, we can get information about its variability. So the percent variability or the percent um, coefficient of variation target should be less than or equal to 36%. You don't need to memorize this or remember it really because it's all present um, in uh, the output from the devices. So this is the standardized report, the AGP or the ambulatory glucose profile, and it contains everything you need to know from the previous slide. It has all of those metrics and it has their targets. So um, the, here are the, the GMI, the time in range, the time below range, the time above range, the glucose variability, and the recommended targets for each of them. Just blowing up the top portion a little bit. So if we focus especially on cardiovascular health here, we know of course that average glycemia, again, typically as measured by A1C, is associated with cardiovascular risk. And this allows through CGM faster feedback and more actionable data than just looking back at the last three months. And that's just for average glycemia. There's emerging evidence that time in range, which is related to, but not the same as average glycemia, is also associated with uh, outcomes risk. And there's great evidence that hypoglycemia, as I mentioned, is associated with cardiovascular risk, including cardiovascular death and arrhythmia. So CGM can be a great tool to apply to cardiovascular risk, especially around hypoglycemia. And as I mentioned, a lot of hypoglycemia is asymptomatic and unrecognized, and a lot of it is nocturnal. Um, so this, this patient in this example has 10% of their time total in hypoglycemia, which far exceeds the target of less than 4%. And 6% of their time is below 54. This is of even greater concern. Uh, the target of that, remember, is supposed to be less than 1%. So I, they're, they're, this patient may be at higher risk of any of those um, uh, outcomes related to hypoglycemia, especially severe hypoglycemia, including those cardiovascular outcomes. So if we look here to these graphs of glucose on the left, we can see that this patient experience is exactly what I was talking about. They have nocturnal hypoglycemia in the more early morning hours. So this graph shows from midnight um, to the following midnight. And between midnight and about 4 or 5 a.m. here, um, this patient is, is experiencing hypoglycemia. And we even see on the far right side of the graph that their blood sugar starts to drop towards that range even before midnight. And this is very actionable. So we can think about medication adjustments that could decrease this overall hypoglycemia. And we can think even about how to target specifically this time of day. And again, this information wouldn't be available to us without CGM. This is just one more example of um, a CGM uh, uh, display. This is taken from a patient's smartphone showing their CGM summary data. And again, it shows everything we were talking about. This patient, by the way, is meeting all of their glycemic targets. So I'm much less worried about her acute cardiovascular risk from hypoglycemia with less than 2% of her time um, uh, in hypoglycemia and her longer-term cardiovascular risk related to overall glycemia because her time in range, her time above range, and her variability are all excellent. So moving to a couple of case studies. Uh, one of my patients is a 67-year-old female who was diagnosed nine years ago with type 2 diabetes. She's been my patient for about six months, having just moved to Colorado. She takes metformin and semaglutide for her diabetes, as well as a statin, an ACE inhibitor, and low-dose aspirin. Her last A1C is 8.4%, and that's down from 8.6%. Her BMI is over 32, and her blood pressure is 122 over 76. And it was after our last visit together when we talked a lot about activity and about diet that we managed together to get her A1C down a little bit, but not much from that 8.6 to 8.4. And she tells me she just doesn't know what else to do. So I asked her about CGM. I explained that it might show her in very clear, discrete ways how her glucose responds to different foods and to different activities. And she doesn't meet the criteria for her insurance coverage actually for personal CGM, but I'm also familiar with the 2021 ADA standards of care. And I was interested in understanding, understanding her patterns of hyperglycemia. So we used professional unblinded CGM on her one time and she came back to review the data. And I'm not gonna review the data here with you now. You're gonna see more of that in a bit from some other cases with Dr. Peters. But most importantly, from her experience, 
I just asked her what she learned. And she told me that she learned so much from watching the graph. She felt the sense of being beholden somewhat to the CGM, sort of knowing that it was watching her and that it could see everything that she was doing, but in a much more meaningful way than just talking about her A1C every three months. And the biggest change she told me uh, was that now she was really thinking about every single thing she ate or drank and that it made her decide not to eat or drink quite a few things. So in this case, it was the one thing that was finally able to motivate her to make real lifestyle changes. And of course, those changes aren't just healthy for her diabetes, but they're healthy for her weight, her blood pressure, her overall cardiovascular health and her cardiovascular fitness. And she's decided to replicate those lifestyle changes even when she's not using a CGM, which is most of the time. So she's just wearing a professional unblinded CGM about once a quarter, and we keep checking in on her that way. And if we look at one other case, another patient of mine is a 52-year-old female with type 2 diabetes for 12 years who's taking metformin, cytogliptin, and once daily long-acting insulin glargine, a statin and ACE inhibitor, levothyroxine, and low-dose aspirin. And her A1C is 7.9%, her BMI is 28.6, and her blood pressure is 118 over 77. And when I mentioned CGM to her, she told me that she was actually going to ask me about it because she saw a commercial about it, and she heard it might mean that she could stop doing finger sticks. So again, being familiar with the ADA standards of care, I wanted to better understand her glycemia, and I had an easier time getting insurance authorization since she takes basal insulin, which is supported by the 2021 ADA standards. Um, so we started with a sample of an intermittently scanned CGM, like the one she had seen on TV, and then she started using them every so often. She didn't use them all the time because we didn't feel that it was essential to do so, and she wanted to at least save some money on her co-payments and not purchase them continuously. And when she came back, she told me some really interesting things. First of all, like my previous patient, she said um, that she was much more deliberate about her food choices. So... This was, I, this was a great step, but that she also told me that she ate a lot less junk. And then she told me that she loved not pricking her finger anymore. And now remember that she was wearing CGM sometimes for 14 days at a time, and then she'd go on and not wear it for a while. So it was really interesting to me when she told me that her adult children had noticed something different. One day her daughter said, mom, you're not wearing one of those sensors right now, are you? And she said, no, how did you know? And her daughter said, because you're so much nicer when you wear them and you're being really crabby now. Can you please try to wear one all the time? So this was a great demonstration to her that when she watched what she ate, even if it was only because she felt a sense of obligation to the sensor and that I would be able to see it later or knowing that I would um, be, be, be talking to her about her data later. But when she watched what she ate, it actually affected her mood for the better. And that when she didn't, her mood was worse. So these are some examples of technology, especially CGM technology in these cases, and their impacts on lifestyle and self-management behaviors and on quality of life. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Peters, who's going to give us a little deeper dive into the actual data side of things. All right. So that was a great talk. Thank you so much. And I'm basically giving two talks, one which is mine and one which is Dr. Isaac's. But I just wanted to take a moment to explain why I think this is so important from a cardiometabolic perspective. Because even though these devices are only currently approved for use in people who are on insulin, I think that increasingly they're going to be used by people not on insulin. And in fact, in the not too distant future, at least some of these devices are gonna be available over the counter. And some of them are going to interconnect with things like Fitbits and Garmin, uh, watches and iPhones and everything else they already do interconnect with iPhones, but they're going to become increasingly prevalent for people who don't necessarily fit the current criteria. And I see patients in two different settings. One's in Beverly Hills. It's all through USC, but it's more like a private practice and patients there can afford to go out and buy their own CGM if they want to see their data. And I also work in an under-resourced part of town where we have to use insurance. But in those patients who can't afford it, I have people with pre-diabetes, diabetes on oral agents, diabetes on GLP-1 receptor agonists. I have all sorts of patients using these. And so when I get to my portion of this, I'm gonna show you some of my patients where they didn't have insulin, they weren't on insulin, and yet I found out a lot from looking at their data. So I think that these devices teach us just as much as they teach the patients. And I don't think that these are gonna just be the domain of diabetologists who have patients on insulin. They're fun for us because they show that we can do something, but actually they're gonna be fun for you as you get to be more familiar with them. 
Now, these are my disclosures. And these are Dr. Isaac's disclosures, so you know where we all come from. And I'm going to talk, to begin with, about time and range. And this is something that I really think is important. So you can have a quote-unquote good A1C, an A1C below 7, and still have lots of variability. Your glucose levels can go from 400 to 40 all day long. And I don't think that that's well-controlled diabetes because that person who's having a lot of variability may well be having a lot of diabetes distress. They may feel that up and down and they may be struggling. They may be going high because they ate too many carbs and they may give too much insulin to come down. And so you can see going from left to right what the lived experience of someone with diabetes is as they go from high variability down to low variability and more time in target range. So I think that looking at the data that comes from CGM is infinitely more useful to me than looking at an A1C because it tells me how we got to the A1C. Now, you heard Dr. Ozer describe this notion of standardized metrics, and this is the ambulatory glucose profile. And much like we read an EKG, we're used to looking at that. We know how we interpret it. The way we interpret the AGP is basically the same. We need to train ourselves to understand what we're looking at and then look at the data in terms of how can we help the patient. And your eye is always drawn to the red for good reason, because that shows you how much time a person's spending in a hypoglycemic range. Green is good. And as long as you're not red, green colorblind, you can see the difference and yellow is too high. But I always tend to look at the red first, just because that's what I want to eliminate. I want to make sure that the time below range is minimized. This looks at the CGM targets. And in people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, we say that less than 4% low is okay, greater than 70% in the target range is good. And then we talk about higher ranges. And there's also a graph for older or higher risk individuals. And I'm not so sure I entirely agree with this, but I do think that in those patients who have comorbidities or who are older, you may want to further reduce your low target because you really don't want those individuals having hypoglycemia. Ideally, you can do that without a rebound increase in highs. And then their pregnancy targets, which are much tighter, the target range there is 63 to 140. And in general, we accept more lows or at least more blood sugars less than 70 as we try to keep people's A1C less than 6% while pregnant. Now, this slide basically looks at time and range versus A1C. And basically what you see is that a time in range of 70% correlates pretty well to what our target A1C would be. So on the right by Beck et al, you can see that 70% time in range is equivalent to an A1C of 7%. And that tends to be the data that we look at as we're establishing the targets. Now, this is a meta-analysis that was just published looking at the impact of glucose variability on a number of important outcomes. And we know from a number of studies that increased glucose variability is independent of A1C associated with rates of hypoglycemia, micro and macrovascular complications, as well as overall mortality. And the studies listed on this slide really show that two of them, HART2D and DIGAMI2, don't show that as well. And those are patients who have had an acute MI. But in most of the diabetes studies and in a few studies looking at acute cardiac syndrome, you see a relationship between variability and outcomes, including CV events and macrovascular events. So I personally think glucose variability is a very important metric and one that we really need to look at and help our patients deal with if they're having a lot of variability. And my bet is, is that we get prospective studies going forward. We're gonna see lots of relationships here. So bear in mind that this is a very important metric. So this is a case study. 
This is a woman named Ellen. She's 69 and she was diagnosed with type two diabetes 33 years ago. And that makes you think that because she's had such long duration diabetes, she probably is relatively insulin deficient. She is in fact on insulin. She's on Glargine 60 units at bedtime and she takes insulin aspart before meals. And she has fixed doses with a correction factor. She's on dapagliflozin. Her A1C is 8.8. Her, her BMI is 37. She has heart failure, sleep apnea, and CKD. And she started on the Dexcom G6. So you know that she's already on an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is good, but you may be able to advance her therapy more and Ideally, you'd help reduce the complexity of her therapy because it's a pretty complicated regimen. And lo and behold, you see this. Basically, you see no red. So she's never low, but what you're dealing with is the fact that she's only 30% time in target range and she's high most of the time. And I have these patients, this is one of Dr. Isaac's patients, but they stay high because it's easier to be high than low. If you're always high like this, you're not going to have hypoglycemic episodes. Now, that is not entirely true because there are patients like this who decide sometimes to give more insulin and then they become low. But here you see that basically she's high. Her average glucose is 213. Her GMI is 8.4. And that's you know very similar to her A1C. So when you analyze this, you wanna look at safety. And as I said, look for the red. And she really has no time below range. Although here on this slide, you can see that she does tend to dip down at night. And that may be because she's over basalized. She may be on too much glargine at night. And you talk to her and you find out that she's actually worried about going low at night. And so that she tends to eat more at night and this is something that I see all the time where people are eating at night because they may go low, that increases caloric intake. And it's not ideal control. It means we need to do something, even though you didn't see much red or any red in the printout. Now, I always focus on the positive. Diana and I and Sean are very similar. I look at the best day. I say, look how great you did today. And let's see why and how. And let's see if we can repeat that. And so her best day is 62% time in range. You can see that she still goes up in the evening because she's eating more at bedtime. Um, this day she eats eggs, toast, and coffee for breakfast, has some mamas at 3 p.m., eats meat and potatoes at 8 p.m., and she is more physically active. Physical activity has a huge role in terms of glycemic profile. So if you look at this, this basically looks at the relationship between time and range and diabetes complications. And all of the data we have is really retrospective data because we don't really have data that we've collected because we haven't had these tools for long enough to look at relationships between time and range and complications. But when you look backward at BGM data, say from the diabetes control and complication trial, you can show that each 10 percentage points decrease in time and range was associated with a 64% increase in retinopathy progression and a 40% increase in microalbuminuria. There are other studies which show similar findings. So we know that microvascular complications and potentially cardiovascular risk and mortality are all increased by patients showing lower time and range. So improving time and range hopefully will be associated with better outcomes. So when you look at the data from Ellen, you basically try to never say good and bad, although patients say good and bad all the time. And they say, I was a bad diabetic. And I say, no, you're not, you're just human. And I try to talk about what it is that leads to days where numbers are higher or lower. And for instance, in this particular day, she happened to miss her glargine dose. She doesn't always remember to take her mealtime insulin. And it ends up being a struggle for her because she knows what to do, but implementing it in her regular life is hard to do. 
So with her, you want to make sure that you configure her alerts so she knows when she's low and we have the capacity to set the alerts on the CGM devices. One always discusses treatment of hypoglycemia and I make sure my patients who are on insulin have glucagon at home. In this case, the glargine dose at bedtime was reduced and she was started on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which has all sorts of positive benefits of which you are all well aware. But in her, it might reduce complexity. So it might reduce the need for prandial insulin. It might also help her with her weight and lead to an overall improvement in her health. So this is two month follow-up now. She's on the GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGL an SGLT2 inhibitor and her basal insulin. Um, she does give some mealtime insulin, but you can see that she's doing much, much better. A lot of the variability is meal related and you've largely eliminated that um, reduction in her glucose is all the overnight, but you may still need to reduce that glargine. So, here, this is progress, real progress. I cheer the patient, make more adjustments and continue going. But you can see that you've made a big difference here because the overall numbers have come way down from 200s down to 162. Her time and range is much better and her estimated A1C or GMI is 7.2. Now, I'm gonna show you some of my cases that don't involve insulin. And I'm doing this in part because it's gonna show you what we are doing now is we're starting patients with relatively good A1Cs on GOP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is a patient of mine, he's 60 years old. He has a six year history of type two diabetes and his A1C has always been great, 5.8 to 6.5. 10 years previously, he had a myocardial infarction from which he fully recovered. And he's really active. He runs and walks three miles a day. He eats pretty well, but he likes eating rice and bread. He's on appropriate uh, agents for his risk factor modification. His blood pressure is 128 over 78. He's relatively lean with a BMI of 26, but of course he wants to be thinner because he lives in LA where everyone's supposed to have a BMI of 21, but I'm just teasing. His LDL, but maybe not. His LDL is 65, his EGFR is 70. His A1C is 6.1 and he said to me, I just wanna know, is this metformin working? I mean, really working. And he wanted a professional CGM. So I put one on him and it kind of amazed me. So this is what you see. This is an A1C of six on metformin. Does anyone out there think this is good control? I don't. And the reason in part, because his measured A1C is so good, as you can see, his overnights are pretty normal. So. His glucose metabolism is great for inhibiting hepatic glucose production. But during the day, as he's eating and going about his life, he is all over the place. He has high postprandials, they come back down, but clearly this is somebody where lifestyle could play a role. But because he has cardiovascular disease, you want him to be on a GLP-1 receptor agonist and or an SGLT2 inhibitor, because that's just now what we do. And this was done a number of years ago. But when I saw this, I said, this isn't what I want. And think about the new guidelines. And I'm on the professional practice committee for the ADA, so I know what the 2022 guidelines are. And I don't think guidelines progress nearly as fast as we all do clinical practice. But what the guidelines say currently, and to some degree subsequently, is the first line therapy for glycemia is metformin and lifestyle. Now, lifestyle is always a part of treating, no matter what we talk about in terms of the other parts of treatment. And metformin's in there because we've had it forever. We know it lowers glucose levels and it's a pretty darn good drug. It's inexpensive and all those other things. But I say, and this is just me, is I don't look at first line therapy that way anymore. I look at the human being and I say, do you have high risk for cardiovascular disease or established cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure? If the answer to any of that is yes, I don't care what else you're on, metformin, nothing, whatever. I think you need to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor and or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And I think everybody now agrees that's what we need to do. So I kind of can the metformin and show you with this case, I stopped the metformin. And you do need to think about A1C because if someone's A1C is low and they're on insulin and you add in another agent, you can make them hypoglycemic. Or if their A1C is really high, you may need to do more than just add one of these drugs. But I really think that we need to just look at the patient as 
what is the entire totality of their risk and what risk are we addressing first? So as I said, I think we need to think about all of the patient. I think we always need to talk about lifestyle. And in some patients like this individual, he was on the leaner side, but still somewhat overweight, is you want to think about patients not losing too much weight. Because I do have patients who have low BMIs that are 22 and 23. And if I put them on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, they may end up losing more weight than I want them to lose. And I've seen patients get whole workups for weight loss when it was actually just the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And then there are these other situations where A1C is relevant as you're adding in the next therapy. If a patient's on a sulfonylurea agent or an insulin with an A1C of 6.1, you're going to want to consider watching out for hypoglycemia. And that's a patient where you might want to put them on CGM so you can see what you're doing. And conversely, somebody who's got an A1C of 10 with symptoms of uncontrolled hypoglycemia, again, another great time for putting on a CGM and adjusting medications. They may need insulin sooner rather than later, or certainly a GLP-1 receptor agonist before an SGLT2 inhibitor. So I think there are a lot of circumstances in which we have to ponder what's really best for the patient and then create a treatment plan that fits their needs. So in this patient's case, I cut back his metformin by 50% in part because I was going to add in a GOP-1 receptor agonist and I wanted to reduce risk of GI side effects. And I find if they're on less metformin, they tend to do better. I started him on semaglutide up titrated. He found religion and changed his diet, reduced the carbohydrates that he was eating. He loses 12 pounds. So he's now exceedingly happy. His A1C measured A1C goes down to six. And I stopped his metformin entirely because he doesn't need metformin anymore. And so now he's just on once weekly semaglutide for his diabetes, but also for cardiovascular protection. And this is what follow-up blinded CGM looks like. So this GMI is 6%. And most of those spikes are eliminated. His overnight glucoses came up a bit when I reduced the metformin and then stopped it. But this is what this patient looks like on semaglutide once weekly. And I think this is pretty darn good and a whole heck of a lot better than I saw before. Um, now, this is one other case. And this is a woman, she's 55 years old. She's on metformin one gram twice a day, no known cardiovascular disease, but she has nephropathy. So she has an albumin creatinine, creatinine ratio of 110, her BMI is 7.1, or sorry, her A1C is 7.1 and her BMI is 28. Well, I wanted to put her on an SGLT2 inhibitor because of her um, diabetic kidney disease, and that made the next best step. She does have a higher BMI, and you may want to use a GLP-1 receptor agonist in addition to help her with weight loss. And now that GLP-1 receptor agonists are approved for weight loss, um, it's not a bad idea. But in this case, this was her before data, again, on metformin alone, again, an A1C that's not bad, or A1C is seven, um, but you can see lots of postprandial spikes. In her case, she ate a lot of carbs for breakfast, and you're most insulin resistant in the morning, and that's the best time to actually discuss diet and to try to get people not to eat so many carbs for breakfast. I think it's a much better idea to eat carbs late in the afternoon when you're more insulin sensitive. So here, lifestyle can help her, but it's not going to help her kidneys nearly as much as going on an SGLT2 inhibitor. So she's now on metformin plus an SGLT2 inhibitor plus isn't eating oatmeal for breakfast. And now you get this profile. And again, this is the right therapy for her based on all current guidelines, metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. She's got some nephropathy and this just looks much better to me again. I'm focused on glucose, but that's what I do for a living. But I also love seeing the data. You didn't need a CGM to tell you this was better, but for her, it showed her that her lifestyle modification improved her outcome. She can own this. She can see that there's an improvement because she changed her habits. So key takeaways from what we've said is hopefully we've expanded you to think beyond A1C. A1C is great for quality metrics and monitoring a population, but it doesn't show you glycemic variability or hypoglycemic episodes. And I think those really need to be addressed as we manage our patients. 
We know that increased glycemic variability is associated with all sorts of outcomes that we're trying to avoid. And CGM lets us see that, but more than letting us see it as the clinicians, it allows patients to see it. It allows patients to see how behavior can change their outcomes. And in many of the studies where we've used CGM, we show improvements in all sorts of outcomes. And it's not necessarily related to change in medication. It has to do with patient knowledge of really what's happening in their bodies. We're empowering them to change. And it, I believe, helps with adherence because if somebody sees that they miss a dose of their medication and their outcomes get worse, they can remember, oh yeah, I better take that medicine, give that shot, do whatever to improve how the CGM looks and ultimately to improve their health. So with that, we're going to go to our resource page and take questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anne. Thanks, Sean. That's a fantastic presentation. Um, appreciate your time and putting all of this together for us. Um, as we wait for questions and answers, or questions at least to come in, use the Q&A box down below so we can get through as many as possible. Um, also want to remind everybody that we do have two upcoming webinars, one on November 10th, and that is looking at the century of diabetes care since the advent of insulin. And then also we have the AHA scientific sessions recap on December 1st. So to register for both of those, you can visit nodiabetesbyheart.org. Uh, so we've got some questions already. Uh, first question, we have patients who are not so tech savvy um, or those who maybe have some kind of decline in memory function. Are you aware of any devices or other tools, resources to help those patients um, who are interested or maybe their caregivers are interested in this technology? Um, well, specifically uh, resources, uh, uh, um, and I would defer to you on that, but, uh, but there are the, the, the most common, th those would be like official resources, but the adult children, for example, other caregivers, um, you know, going, going back to a good model for people with declining cognitive function is children who don't, who haven't yet developed full cognitive function, right? So um, uh, younger children, these are, uh, CGMs are ubiquitously used uh, so much in, in, in childhood type one diabetes, and it's not the child who's managing it. So um, there, there, there are ways to do this. I, I would, I rely more on professional CGM. I think with some of my less tech savvy uh, uh, patients, um, because I need to be the one, or the practice, my, my, um, uh, the support staff in the practice uh, need to be the ones who, who handle the technology, and we can review it later. I think, Anne, you really touched on a, a, a great point about um, being able for the for the patients to be able to see their data and how um, eye opening that is to them, and I. This isn't based on any particular guidelines or anything, right? But um, I, I frequently have the experience of someone reduces, like my patient in the, the case example I gave with an A1C, she reduced her A1C from 8.6 to 8.4. And she was very pleased with that reduction, a little bit frustrated that it wasn't more, but it's a little bit easier for patients to say, oh, that's a that's closer. It's you know, that's but then when we show them the 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 graphs from the CGM readout, like you were displaying, and um, that doesn't look as nice to people, right? That that you can go from like the the first one in your last case where the basically it looked like coloring outside the lines, which is messy and bothers people. They don't feel comfortable with that. And the next one was much more inside the lines and that, that's a much better feeling for people. So um, what else, what, what other resources, Anne? Well, so this is the, the problem is that it's really hard to manage patients no matter where you are as they get older and lose cognitive function. And diabetes is particularly numeric as a disorder. And I take care of all sorts of people who are taking care of adult children who have Down syndrome or who are schizophrenic or have all sorts of um, barriers to care. And I individualize this more than anything else. And I have some seniors where I really want the data, but they pull off the sensors. And what I try to do is work with the team, whether it's an aide or an adult caregiver, family member, whoever's doing it and see if I can use CGM and use it in a very simple way, because I'm not really caring about all the details. And in fact, for a lot of these people, I don't really care what they eat because I just want to keep them. It's all about quality of life at that point. Um, but it depends on the circumstance, but I 
I find that if, if there's the time available to work with an educator to teach the aide, the family member who's there, and then they choose to do it, it becomes much easier for them if they swipe as opposed to finger stick. And I have, you know, patients who will rebel against finger sticks. And these aren't just kids. <laughs> these are older people. And again, CGM can help, but it also can give you too much information. So I, I really customize it. I'm thinking in my brain about, you know, seniors I have where the daughters just do finger sticks twice a day and send me the data. So I'll take whatever data I can get when managing people who don't do self-management but need group management. Um, and then nursing homes have a lot of trouble with devices, if you ask me, um, as do hospitals. And I would love to see more ability to use devices in those settings. But again, you have to be able to parse down the information to something that nurses and aides and everyone else can handle. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing this, but as far as I can tell, myself and my educators are the big resources because training needs to happen to make this work. So speaking of resources, uh, do you know of any patient assistant programs for CGMs and patients that do not have medical insurance? Well, I can speak to that from California. So mm -hmm. there's, depending on your state, there are different rules. And um, one of the problems in California is that it's not on the, what we call Medi-Cal, which everyone else calls Medicaid formulary, just as it is. So I spent a great deal of time trying to get devices through um, for my patients who have Medi-Cal. But in terms of the resources, when COVID was at its worst, there were programs from the sensor companies to get devices if people lost their jobs. But I've actually found it hard to get real patient assistance or samples or any other thing. They're, they're pretty tight with them. Um, so I know this isn't necessarily the answer, but I have my patients in my wealthier side of town donate money to a foundation that actually buys sensors for my patients in the less well-served part of town and I give them sensors, but that is not really the world's best model, but it's the best I can do. Sean, what about in Colorado? Any additional things to add here? Yeah, the, the and you mentioned Medicaid and, and the, um, really you just have to see what your state does. Colorado just added Medicaid coverage for CGM uh, within the past year. It's only for type one diabetes at this point. Um, but and we see, and as you mentioned, the, the guidelines don't change as quickly as, um, as, as maybe we'd like them to, and maybe clinical practice does, but the insurance guideline, the insurance coverage criteria change even more slowly. They're always reacting uh, later, right, to the, to the guideline changes. So I think that we'll see improved coverage, but um, I, and it, it's also interesting to me to hear, and that, you know, as you're a world-renowned endocrinologist, diabetologist, who's, you know, a leader in her field um, and having trouble getting samples, I'm a family doc and I've had an easier time getting samples, um, which um, I'm glad, but uh, I'm not glad that it's been easier than for you, but I'm glad that it's been relatively easy for me to get those samples, but sort of judicious use of those samples when you can get them. Uh, I think is great. The professional CGM um, often requires a lot less um, authorization and a lot fewer uh, hoops to jump through than to get uh, personal CGM authorized and can be a great entry point too. The, the, the device manufacturers also do have um, uh, copay limits and, and cards and coupons and they're, you know, like GoodRx has, has coupons that can be helpful. Um, the prices can vary quite a bit. I know that some of the, the membership um, warehouse type of pharmacies uh, can, can offer greatly reduced prices compared to some of the other commercial pharmacies. Well, thank you. All right, we're almost at the top of the hour, so we will leave it there. Um, Dr. Sean Oser, Dr. Ian Peters, thank you both so much for your time this afternoon. Thanks to all of you who uh, participated in this webinar. We're glad to have you. Uh, if you want to have access to this after the fact, we will be popping this archive on our website, No Diabetes byheart.org uh, so you can access it there in just a few days. But thanks everybody and be well. Thank you. Thank you very much.